Hello. Good morning. Good afternoon. Hey, Alex, are you there? I can't hear it. I'm here. Can you hear me now? Yep. Good morning. Good morning. Afternoon, I guess. There. Yeah. <laughs> Just wait a couple more minutes and then we can start. I was hoping um, Sugu would be joining soon. Okay, I think we can start. Um, so we have two documents um, that we wanted to um, that we wanted to review this time around. Um, the first is the database paper that Sugu has been working on, um, and the second is the project review process that um, uh, that Aaron has been working on. Um, Sugu, do you want to sure. just give an update as to where we are on the on the database doc? Um, of I know that uh, Quinton has um, put some feedback into the doc, and I've just written up some some notes that I'd like to go through as well. Um, sure. Yeah. Um, so uh, uh, initially, I think the uh, there was some confusion about. Uh, what the definition of a database is. I think uh, many of the comments came from that. Uh, right. Initially, uh, when I wrote the document first, I had categorized uh, pure relational DB uh, databases as well as the new SQL ones as relational. Uh, and, uh, and there was no uh, a clear differentiation between the two. And I think, uh, uh, some some paragraphs were talking about uh, the pure relational ones, and some were talking about the new SQL ones, and uh, that clarity was missing. Um, and so I think now what I have done uh, is uh, actually clearly separated the two, uh, it's, uh, talking about pure relational as one category and new SQL as the other category. New SQL is kind of slightly broad, uh, and they have. Uh, a large variation in what they support, but I've tried to address them in a generic fashion. Uh, so that is uh, uh, one, that's, I believe that's the main change I had made in the document. Uh, Understood, okay. Yeah. And um, uh, there was also, uh, you probably, you were not there in our last discussion. No, uh, I wasn't, I missed that, sorry. Yeah, there was a discussion about uh, what is a database uh, in general, uh, like Cassandra was considered as one, uh, whether it should be a database or not. I think 
it was borderline, so we decided to include it. Uh, but we already have a key value store section. And so maybe, it may, I'm thinking maybe we should uh, talk about the fact that this line is blurring and some systems, uh, whatever, get categorized as in both. Yeah, I, I, so I think that's, that's, that's a fair point. Um, so, so I wrote some notes at the, at the end of the document just because I couldn't find the right place to add the comments for it. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, so, so I think, I think one of the things, you know, that we were discussing in the past was, um, in the rest of the white paper, we had, we had kind of defined the, the attributes like, you know, performance and consistency and durability and whatever. Um, and I think it's probably worth, um, adding a paragraph or two around consistency and eventual consistency and things like that. Um, and, and any other attributes that we, that we consider, um, as important for for databases. Um, so, for example, one of the one of the other things that I thought about was, you know, do we do we need to discuss the topologies of the databases um, specifically in terms of you know things like consistency versus availability versus partition tolerance and things like that? Um, I actually. Uh, uh... So the the debate I'm having about it is uh, is those are uh, generic considerations, uh, not necessarily um, a cloud native concern. But it uh, yeah. I I don't have an objection to adding it. I mean it's it's an important thing to that people should think about when deploying databases. Yeah, I I I think. Um... I think um, we we actually have a section in the white paper around sort of the CAC theorem, and, you know, in broad terms. Um, but what I was thinking is that um, some of these some of these items, you know, we, we should discuss the attributes in terms of the different topologies or the different database architectures. So, for example, if you're um, if you're operating with a master slave type environment, for example, you have particular consistency and availability attributes, whereas if you have a, a large scale distributed um, system, which is, you know, sharded or, or whatever else, you know, like, like, um, like for tests or, or even, you know, things like uh, spanner or whatever, um, you have different consistency and different um, um, availability. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I can, uh, I can. Uh, there's, a, there is actually uh, the third, uh, the third, the, the there is a third property which is durability. Uh, so yes. basically, all these systems juggle with these three: durability, consistency, and availability. Yeah. yeah. So, so I mean, in in the previous in in sort of previous sections where we found these sorts of things, we we even made just like a, a little table, which kind of just said, you know, for these three types of topologies, these are the relevant attributes that you should expect. And it kind of helps to select sort of different usage patterns or, you know, different um, types or classes of database for different use cases. Sounds good. Yeah. I have actually referenced uh, that section in this uh, thing. It's section 9.4. Right. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, I'm um, in favor of the table too. And, um, you know, in terms of a table, I think maybe you have to, there are just so many potential databases that I don't think you can cover all of the dozens or maybe even a hundred that are out there. So first pigeonhole them with some popular examples in each category and then cover maybe in the table, the topology differences, the factors involving wanting to split. If, if this database is implemented by multiple nodes, there often are going to be failure domain considerations and storage failure domain considerations that might be independent of the compute. So um, I think maybe covering that in table would be great. Hmm. Well, and yeah, I, I, that's why I think it's always dangerous even listing the popular ones. I mean, could we just figure out what the 
technical architectural differences are and separate them out and then have the list not lead with the popular examples but lead with the um architecture the classes yeah, the yeah taxonomy. classes of data yeah i agree with that it's just that having you know sometimes you can have a bunch of text and somewhere in there throwing a popular example might solidify it in somebody's mind if they're familiar with something i i don't want to be kingmakers here and nominate whatever examples we give as, you know, the foremost examples in the category, though. So, so that we don't rehash the debate from the white paper, we we <laughs> we kind of had we kind of had quite an extensive debate as to what we include and what we don't include in terms of project names or whatever else. We we certainly said um, we should include. Um, um, we should include references to some popular examples that allow people to apply, you know, um, context to what they already know, because that helps them understand the document. So, for example, it's kind of nuts to describe an object store without mentioning S3, and it's kind of nuts to talk about a key value store without talking about etcd, for example, um, especially where maybe some of those projects are are CNCF projects as well. Um, so, so I think having a handful of, of examples is is fine, as because especially if they're sort of you know generic household names. But I agree in general we're we're not aiming to be kingmakers here. But where an example serves the purpose of clarifying the document, I think that's fine. Yeah, I think I. Uh... Uh, yeah, I, I definitely agree with uh, leading with uh, architecture and uh, um, and if uh, if if like for example, if Spanner definitely uh, is the leader in some of those architectures, so it may uh, if something relevant to Spanner is mentioned, there is no harm in talking about it. Yeah, the one uh, I, the one thing I'm wondering about is. Uh, uh, there is this concept of atomic clock uh, that uh, many of them use for uh, a better uh, serializable consistency. Uh, Spanner, uh, that, that kind of is a, is a big subject. So I don't know if, uh, I'm wondering if uh, we should even mention that. Well, so, so I think in, in all of these things, right, there is, um, there is a question mark as to you know do you consume this as a service do you do you cons do do you build this um, you know and similarly for example we we kind of said when we were discussing topologies in, in in the white paper we said you know sharded systems are great at balancing out the load but one of the disadvantages is you know you have to you might have to um, have operational requirements to to rebalance workloads if you kind of get the shards wrong in in the first place um, you know and, and and those were like some of the pros and cons for each of the different topologies so I think it's it's completely fair to say that if you want a really big distributed scalable database and you want um, strong consistency and not eventual consistency then you know things like strict timekeeping are uh, are a complexity factor and if you're considering it you know this isn't just like something you can you can ignore cool cool so i'll give it a shot i'll try to um, i'm thinking this is probably about uh, two or three more paragraphs hopefully i'll try to uh, constrain myself to about two or three paragraphs to see if i can cover uh, all the trade offs uh, and then we can have another review of those parts. Yeah, with regard to your comment about the clocks, I'd say that certainly if the, the clock requirements for something are so tight that it presents difficulty in containerizing it, then it, it needs to be mentioned. Oh yeah, you're right. Um, uh, uh, yes, yes, we can't, uh, we can't necessarily expect uh, clocks to be accurate uh, in a cloud. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, yeah. And and then one sort of one other small point I had was, you know, do we want to do we want to discuss um, or or include a paragraph for sort of caching layers? Um, and does it, you know does a cache like Redis or whatever count as a database, for example? Um, oh, like oh yeah, Redis and. Uh, 
Uh, yeah, red is most definitely counts. I mean, it can be used as a cash, but you certainly have the option of putting backing storage on it. And it, I've encountered many instances where it's done. So there's no doubt to me that Redis is in the database category. I think Redis is more a key value though. Uh, it it, it probably, is, but yeah. key values are a form of database. I mean, etcd is a key value too. Yeah. So that's the thing which I'm, we, because we have already have a separate section for key value stores. Uh, I'm wondering, may uh, I'm even, I, I, I thought maybe we should merge the two, you know, <laughs> like, uh, because many of them are evolving into databases and databases are, uh, so many databases now start to give key value APIs. I mean, honestly, if, if, if that's the, if that's the right call to kind of have one section, which is called key value stores and databases and discuss them together, that's probably fine. Yeah, um, like Mongo just announced uh, transactions. <laughs> so right. they're completely blurring now. Yeah, and, and you know, and, and we also have, for example, we have um, Titanium KV, the TIKV um, project, um, which is used as a backing store for the TIDB project. Um, and the TIKV is, is already a CNCF project anyway. So, um, so yeah, if, if you think it makes sense to merge, that's not something I would be against. The question is, uh, should we iterate towards that, right? Or should we go for the big bang and... Well, it's probably easier to, to stick to databases and then you know, add in, uh, uh, if we think that, if we really think that they should be merged, we can always do that as a second step, but it's it's kind of up to you. If you if you think yeah. it's too hard to, to keep the separation, then. So I think what I'll do is uh, I will, I will definitely mention that these lines are blurring and, uh, uh, and that um, sometimes things can uh, come in both categories. I think that's important to mention. And then uh, maybe we can do another shot at putting, uh, putting the two together and see how that looks as a separate attempt. And then yeah. that looks good, we can merge that in. Yeah, that probably makes sense. Cool, so I have to, uh, so uh, I have two, two points. One is to mention uh, this, that the lines are blurring. The other one is the two or three paragraphs about the trade-offs. There was one more thing I think uh, you said we needed to talk about. Uh... Oh, um, and I also I also mentioned. Do you want to mention sort of proxies and load balancers or 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 things like that? I don't know whether it's much of a factor or not. Actually, I have a specific paragraph for that. I am actually uh, um, stating that a proxy is more or less a necessity to run in the cloud. Right. Uh, yeah, it's coincidentally, uh, Kelsey tweeted the same thing yesterday. <laughs> oh, right. Well, I, 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 know, I know that, for example, um, you know, things like um, um, Envoy, for example, are actually adding um, database protocol level um, sharding and things like that to the, the, the proxy layer. Um, so for example, I, I know that they added support for MySQL and they added support for Redis um, and, and they actually do a bit of sharding themselves. Oh, you know. Yeah. Yeah, so the section, uh, let me see, uh, the section is, uh, uh, yeah, the one uh, where I uh, where I talk where I have the comment says this is specific to MySQL and Postgres. Right. So we can maybe expand that out a little bit. Uh, I tried to not mention any specific proxies. I I I think it's I think it's fine to mention something like like Envoy because it's it's um it's a CNCF uh, yeah, merger yeah. project anyway so. Yeah, yeah. I, I agree with that. Yeah. So I will expand that out. So I know I let me know. Time to start making notes. <laughs> so I need to mention uh, the lines are blurring. I need to mention the three sections on uh, three trade-offs. And 
uh, proxies. Okay. Brilliant. Very cool. Thanks for all of this. Let me, uh, let's go through your uh, comments, make sure that uh, they are all covered. Uh, consistency and eventual, we are going to cover that. Do we need to, yes, the second and third, uh, first and second are a combined topic. Yep. No SQL and document databases. Uh, for now, we'll choose a category and put them there uh, for now. And then eventually we'll look at merging them. Yep. Uh, Cassandra, I think uh, last time we agreed that it should be in databases. I, th I think it's a clear example of a borderline case. Yep. Uh, cockroach, uh, strong consistency that goes back to the first and first two. Yep. Databases based on an underlying, uh, underlying key value store. Um, yeah, I think uh, cool. I will. I will. I think that's a good good point. We should fold that into the new SQL categories because that's where they are most relevant. Uh, in memory databases and or caching layers. So with that we. Uh, um, uh, I think uh, maybe I will add an edit for the for section nine to mention Reddit and uh, uh, memcache. Okay. Um, uh, so Redis is already mentioned in section nine. Oh, say, oh okay, oh, cool, perfect, awesome. Yeah. So no need to change that. Uh, use of proxies we have all, I've already added. Oh, cloud provided databases. That would be a can of worms because they are all <laughs> <laughs> commercial, and there is actually like um, in the last year or so, there's probably like hundred vendors that claim to be cloud provider databases. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> Including, by the way, Planet Scale, we are about to announce uh, our own uh, cloud provider with test database. <laughs> right. Okay. Uh, so. All right. So, so maybe let's not get let's not open <laughs> that particular kind of worms. Yeah. So yeah, I'm really afraid of that. <laughs> the, the, it's a very contentious uh, subject. I think. That's. That's fair enough. Let's not do that. <laughs> cool, cool. All right. So I will make this. I'll try to make these edits within the next week or two, uh, and then uh, let's have another uh, go over this one. That's awesome. All right. Shall we move on to um, to Aaron's stock in that case next? So the 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 latest version of the doc is in the um, meeting minutes agenda. Um, have people found that or? And the title this? should be CNCF Sandbox Process Template Open. And the reason for that is there were two docs. One didn't have the proper permissions for people to comment. I'll also put the link here in the chat just in case you can't find it in the agenda. Ah, oh, perfect. Thank you. So yesterday I was uh, invited last minute to the CNCF closed session um, to talk about the stock to the TOC and they were oh, brilliant, extremely receptive and excited about this. Um, they were going to spend some time going through and adding comments, um, but they, they fully agreed that yeah, we, we need a, a better, well-defined deterministic process for people to understand um, and how the SIGs interact with the, the TOC long-term. So the, it's still pretty rough, but I wanted people to, to weigh in. And I didn't intend this to be a polished document by any means, but just to solicit feedback and come up with a better process. So the main points that the, C, that the TOC agreed on was time boxing, that you know, there should be a responsibility on the TOC to review things within a timely manner and provide a response back. Um, there should be a way that projects understand if they are rejected, why they're rejected. Um, and um, you know, with the possibility of like a re-review. So the, we talked about the TOC saying like, you know, here's the criteria by which we're judging. The, it doesn't fit these 
things, but we would re-review it in three to six months if these things are fixed. Or it's not cloud native, you know, by design and therefore it's rejected. So I, I think they have a problem of not saying no and, uh, and or just letting things flail um, because they don't want to say no. And so I think that that has to stop. So, um, and they also agreed we don't have have a good process now for what the this thing's responsibility is because I, I told them I feel like we end up with duplication now now we have SIGs we review things we give them a recommendation and then the project still end up presenting um, to the TOC and we start over from scratch so how do we also make it a more efficient process it makes sense to have the subject matter experts review the projects and do the due diligence and give a recommendation so um, how do we do that better so I don't know Alex, I don't know that we need to go through it line by line or if people just want to put their comments in and I can tell the TOC that we have reviewed it as a SIG and maybe give it to SIG apps next and have them weigh in before we. Yeah, definitely. We can, um, I think we all should, um, I think we, we should all review this. So if I'm, if I'm just looking at this, um, um, in terms of, in terms of sections, we're kind of defining um what we expect out of the out of the toc and the process and the timeline and what also what the process in the sig itself should be right in terms of when they hand it over to us yes and the other thing that they were kind of knocking around that i think is worth noting yesterday on the call was having yet another level of entry into the CNCF that's just for neutral IP. To me, that's what Sandbox was supposed to be. Um, so I just wanted to point that out. It's under the project rejection, recommendation project marinade in the Linux Foundation public group. We're trying to find out what that level was. There was no decision made on it, but then they just talked about, well, maybe we, we need somewhere that it just goes and, and gets more contributions or fix, you know, fixes governance or et cetera. And to me, I always thought that's what the intention of Sandbox was. So I think there's definitely still some uh, cohesiveness that has to happen of what the expectations are at each one of these levels. So it's, it's good that we're talking mm -hmm. with them about it. Mm. I mean, as we had previously discussed, uh, some of the challenges were having um, um, having sort of the, this this perception that the goalposts were changing because maybe different criteria were getting applied to to different projects, and I and I think having having this um, having this process formalized will hopefully remove that that issue. I'm I'm not entirely convinced that we need something more than a sandbox, honestly, or or yeah. something less than a sandbox, personally, because I think the sandbox is kind of very intentionally broad. Um, I agree, and I was a bit surprised by the suggestion, um, but just hoping that this helps because I, I told them my concern is. One, there's no time around any of these things. Key cloak that we proposed has been in over a year waiting to be given a decision. And to me, that's not only has the entire TOC changed, but it seems like the criteria by which they're judged has changed, right? So things have to be time boxed and people have to understand the criteria which they're getting judged against because though I know they have good intentions, then I think I hear these rumblings of unfairness, right? Like, well, how come this project got in, but my project didn't get in and why was it rejected? And, and, and I think they also haven't been doing that in the public. They, they do it quietly in the background, but that doesn't help other projects learn what they should be doing. So I think that's... I think it's okay to say the project doesn't fit based on this criteria and have that be public information. I don't think that needs to be done in private. So I'm hoping there is more transparency that comes out of this. Yeah, yeah I think people may be concerned about uh, once they know it, they may game it. 
<laughs> so maybe we need to have a way to verify, right? Yes, and that, that Joe Beta brought that up. Like he doesn't want to have like a criteria and they say, well, I've met all these, so then you have to accept me. Um, and I tried to make the language in there uh, address things like that. Like these are the minimum viable criteria. These are not the completeness of what it needs to, to be. You know, I mean, we, it just needs to be worded in a way that um, gives the TOC the flexibility, but it also gives a good enough direction for these projects. So mm. um, I don't know. It's, it's hopefully a step in the right direction. I, 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 I think it's definitely a step in the right direction. I mean, for, for what it's worth, my, my two cents is that the sandbox is a great place where a project can mature and get and gain its 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 first few steps under the foundation right um and i think a lot of the challenge and, and you know especially the comment about the gaming right is because the sandbox shouldn't be about um um marketing or or sort of gaining um uh gaining commercial sort of plaudits or whatever from the CNCF because you're in the, in the sandbox. It should be about building up the community, building up the governance and whatever else to get to the point where, where you go, get into incubating. And I think the, the, the key thing that's missing here is that, you know, the guidelines around um, not marketing and keeping the sandbox projects as a separate category um, are really, really important because a lot of the question marks that we kind of keep on keep keep on hitting around the moving goalposts are because the sandbox projects then inadvertently do get marketed and things like that. So people do see the sandbox projects as getting a gain, um, and I think that's that's a challenge here. We we if if there wasn't that perception of getting a gain and it was all about the community, then um, some of these issues would just go away. Well, once you become sandbox project, then by default, you will have like an intro and deep dive session at KubeCon, right? I think that's huge too. Um, so even if they say no marketing, uh, definitely once you become a sandbox project, you get a lot of more traction. Yeah, well, that, that is true. Well, and I agree and I, I, it was unsettling to hear such diverse comments around sandbox in, in from the TOC board of what people thought it should be. You know what I mean? Like, I think some people have really high expectations of what they think a sandbox project should be. Whereas I have, I feel like a long time ago, we removed like the due diligence for sandbox for the exact reason that it could, it could grow and flourish and expand the community there. So, I mean, things like that have to be, you know, it has to be consistent for every single member on the board of what they expect or, or, you know, it's chaos. Yeah, the the fact that like, I think when they were discussing sandbox projects, they were talking about like uh, having like a hundred, like accepting them in the hundreds, uh, which kind of, which probably won't scale for these uh, KubeCon SIG talks, right? If suddenly like hundred of them want to present, that's probably not going to work out eventually. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I agree. So feel free to add comments, suggestions. You can put it directly in the doc or add it as a comment. I, I mean, I don't, I want it to be a community driven document. I don't feel like I necessarily need ownership of any of this. I just would like to include it for everyone. And I think we've certainly ran into some of these things, you know, just as one of being one of the new SIGs reviewing projects. So your input is definitely desired. So. That's cool. Did you, um, did you commit to um, uh, having this sort of done by any particular date or having it handed off to the next SIG by any particular date? No, they just, it, it was like a last minute thing. Hey, can you join and talk about your doc? And I said, sure. And then I, I didn't commit to dates or finalization. They, they wanted some time to review. I can bring that up on the next public call and we can figure out a date that we could drive. Right. 
ideally, I think we would want it done by KubeCon. We would want to have this criteria set forth, published, and you know, so new projects can look at adhering to that. Yeah, I think that's a good goal to have. That's a good goal to have. Okay. That sounds good. Um, were there any other sort of specific points we wanted to discuss around this process? I mean, were there any you know particular um, process points that you wanted specific feedback on right now, or or can we do this offline? I'm fine with everyone just adding their comments offline. Okay, cool. Um, okay, so what I wanted to do next then is the the, um, the last thing on the agenda is to discuss um, the, the benchmarking and performance um, paper, which I've only just started putting together. Um, and I kind of want to apologize for letting this slip. I was meant to um, set up a call a couple of weeks back and then life happened and it didn't quite happen as I planned. So what I'd like to do um, just now is um, discuss some of the ideas and perhaps have a little bit of a, um, a brainstorm so that I can put some, um, uh, an outline together and share with the with the group, and then we can actually have um, a meeting to start sort of fleshing out some of the some of the details of this of this paper. Um, so, in terms of in terms of scope for this paper, what we wanted to kind of do was have um, a place where we can offer information on the tools and methods. Um, for measuring performance and, and benchmarking the cloud native storage. Um, and what I wanted to specify as goals were going to be um, sort of the following three things. Um, define the commonly used tools and, the, and their test criteria. Define the, um, the common pitfalls that, that people come across. Um, and provides the ability for users to use these tools to measure their own environments. Um, specifically, the non-goals, so the things that we absolutely don't want to touch, is we're not going to be publishing benchmark numbers, and we're not going to be providing um, sort of our own vendor or product or, or, or project comparisons. It's 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 all about sort of providing the end user with the ability to run their own tests. Thoughts, comments, questions? Does that make sense? Um, w why would we not publish the benchmark numbers? Just curious. Um, so, so my take on this is um, benchmarks are very, very often kind of how long is a piece of string sort of concept. It is, there are so many, um, there are so many items that can affect a benchmark from the environments that you run it in, the CPU, the cloud instances, the networking, the actual physical storage, how everything's interconnected, how the storage is configured and everything like that. that actually providing numbers is generally very specific to a very specific uh, environment. And I think it's always kind of opening yourself up to, to sort of being gamed because it, it kind of creates this environment where, you know, different people might want to publish different benchmarks and they tweak everything for a particular use case. Um, and I don't really want to get into that um, into that uh, arena where we're having to argue the pros and cons or the how do you compare apples to apples um, between different uh, benchmarks, different numbers. So what I'd really like to focus on is to give people 
the ability to run their own tests on their own environment. So if they're if they're looking to test two projects in their or, or, or two tools in their or two providers or service providers or two storage vendors in their Kubernetes cluster, they can use um, uh, they can use the tools to to sort of compare them in their own environment as opposed to and, and, and obviously what it allows them to do is for the end users to then actually publish their own numbers, but that would be their numbers for their environment as opposed to our numbers in some hypothetical environment. Yeah, and people cheat a lot. Uh, they like turn off safety features of the databases to get better numbers and stuff. <laughs> so. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, and, 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 and this is why I said, you know, I, I kind of want to document common pitfalls. So for example, you know, um, storage systems will go faster if they're replicating with loose consistency or asynchronously rather than synchronously. And, you know, they will perform amazingly if the entire data set exists in cache and isn't actually hitting, you know, physical media, for example, and things like that. So these are things we can, we can actually, you know, have a few paragraphs to actually document these things so people know what they're comparing. But I, I don't really want to get into the, into the complex scenarios of trying to justify why a particular system has a particular number, because I think that's, if, if, you know, if promoting a particular project is a can of worms, describing the performance of a particular project is a gigantic can of worms. I'd agree with that. I, I'd maybe even, even if we give users the tools to run their own benchmarks and then publish them, I'd even be go so far as to say maybe we'd be hesitant to publish links to those unless we're prepared to validate that the tests were done in a repeatable and provable fashion. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, at the end of the day, we, we don't want to become like an SPC institute or whatever, right? To, to, to sort of um, have paid performance tests or something like that. That's kind of not the scope of this. This is, this is more a case of we've written a paper and people understand the different aspects and different attributes of a storage system. And what we're trying to do here is give them the capability of measuring one of the attributes, which happens to be performance. And we might, you know, the, the next thing might well be something like consistency, for example, and we might suggest different tools to, to test those kind of um, conditions. But um, I don't want to actually be in the market of publishing the marketing numbers, so to speak. <laughs> yeah, I agree. So the, the summary is, we're going to set ourselves up to teach people how to fish. We're not going to catch fish for them, and we're not going to run the fish market. <laughs> Basically, yeah. <laughs> and so do we need to have a disclaimer that they can't also use those numbers to feed their own? Like, I don't at all disagree with the reasoning behind it, but I also don't want it to be used as a weapon against other people saying, using the benchmarks for their own purpose then i mean do how, how will we prevent the other side of it even though we don't publish it how do we prevent other people from taking those numbers and doing comparisons and saying, are you saying you're afraid of something like some vendor puts out a press release saying we ran the official cncf benchmark process and here's the numbers exactly um not that i would think anyone on this call all would ever do anything like that. I'm just, you know, I don't want it to be used as a weapon against us that we're suddenly in the middle of. Well, I think unless we made some attempt to ban people from making statements like that, we can't stop them. No, but we could also have like, before they use the tool, they have to agree to that. Like these are not to be released for public. This is just for personal use. Right. We, you know, so, we need to have some really strong legal disclaimer for the use of the tool before they even are allowed to access. So, so, so first off, so a couple of things. In in the first instance, we're not building a tool or a framework. We're describing tools which are publicly available anyway. Um, and most of those have some sort of disclaimers anyway of their own. But but either way 
you know, we're not saying, we're not building a tool that somebody is going to use the CNCF storage tool or whatever, right? Um, but also, secondly, I think the CNCF has fairly well documented things around trademarks and things like that. You can't really use um, things like CNCF and the logo of the CNCF and, and all of those sort of things without the CNCF's permission. So um, I'm not I'm not too worried about that. And the CNCF yeah. are actually pretty draconian at enforcing that as well. Yeah, I agree. And and the other thing in terms of stopping them from a legal perspective, in the sense that you know we're pretty much on an open source license with uh, it, that allows people to fork at will. Uh, I don't see how, since anything we produce would be under the open source license, that people couldn't take whatever it is and declare that they had forked it, therefore they can do whatever they want. Yeah. Yeah, but that's a good point. Okay. I just, I just wanted to note my concern there, but I think you guys are right. There, there should be framework in place and people decide to use it on their own anyways. I mean, you can't stop them from using open source stuff to justify things. Yeah. So I, I mean, guess uh, uh, we should talk about how to uh, uh, configure the tools and basically not how to configure the database that they are testing against, right? That's what it amounts to. Yeah, exactly. And, I mean, and mention that this benchmark tests this type of workload, so make sure that your the workload that you intend to run in your production matches what the benchmark is trying to do. That that was my plan, and you know it all. It also means that people can, you know, use the tools to benchmark different configurations. So you know something like if they want to measure, um, you know, the query performance between having two replicas and three replicas, for example, you know, they can also do that, you know, that, that kind of thing. So, so initially, um, what I was, what I was thinking of doing was um, focusing on um, volumes and databases as two things to to measure. Um, I know that we could also potentially um, do key value stores, but um, I don't have a ton of experience in that space unless somebody wants to help with that area. But certainly, you know, in the in the volume space, there are um, there are a number of uh, good open source tools, including, you know, like the obvious ones like FIO, um, where we can sort of document um, the different types of um, uh, different types of, of sort of benchmarking criteria and um, block sizes and random versus sequential and read write um, ratios and caching versus non-caching and compressed versus uncompressed and deduped versus undeduped and you know all of those you know obvious things which are which are fairly well understood and I think with um, with databases there's you know certainly quite a bit um, we can do with um, things like uh, you know sysbench or something like that um, with key value stores perhaps there's the YSCB benchmark suite which which is quite popular there but um, um, I would probably need a bit of help to 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 structure that bit of the document. So, so what do you guys think about um, sort of focusing on volumes and databases as a, as a first step? Yeah, so we have uh, uh, we have ourselves run uh, both Sysbench and TPCC benchmarks, and. Uh, uh, when I was at YouTube, we actually ran YCSB against uh, Vitas, but those are kind of, uh, um, I don't know how much YCSB has evolved since then. Right. Uh, yeah. Um, I mentioned that I, uh, I could uh, uh, have the person who ran the benchmarks uh, document about how it should be run. Sysbench is fairly straightforward. Uh, you just point it at a database and then it runs its queries. 
TPCC is uh, more complicated. And uh, there's recent interest about TPCC benchmarks, uh, but uh, for a long time, nobody even talked about them. Are, are the TPCC benchmarks um, sort of publicly available or, or do you have to purchase some sort of license to use them? Oh, it's a public standard and there are many implementations. Excellent, okay. There's uh, one actually, there's actually a Sysbench uh, Lua version. Uh, so you can be actually run TPCC using Sysbench itself. Oh, I did not, I was not aware of that. Okay. Yeah, That's Perkona really published uh, open source that project. Uh, that's actually what we used for our TPCC. So, so Nick, I see, I see you're on the call, and I know that um, previously you had reached out to uh, to say that you might be interested in helping out on this. Did, did you have any um, ideas on this? Well, the only thing I was going to I was going to say, I, I think um, I agree with what's been said so far. It was just the section at the beginning with the commonly used tools and common pitfalls. Um, I wonder whether we also need to define the concepts, and I think there was a reference to that, but I wonder whether, um, you know, in terms of latency, what that really means, um, spikes versus average latency, uh, throughput, um, and then, you know, even down, do we need to go to the level of saying SSD right cliffs and that sort of impact, or do we gloss over that? Um. SSD, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, so, so, I mean, that that would be the SSD right cliffs would would be one of those things where um, I would suggest it would come under the common pitfalls. Yep. So you know, just because people run these sort of tests and and if they don't run them for long enough, for example, they they uh, they kind of get to to see the cached version of the ssd and um and then it slows down over time yep. um and and i guess you know that sort of thing also applies when you're benchmarking in the cloud because very often um the cloud providers provide you with a certain number of iops for a for a for a volume and then um you kind of run out of credits and it's it's almost <laughs> similar to an ssd right cliff <laughs> um so so yeah i think i think that's probably worth doing. Um, so, if we're if, if we're kind of agreed on on some of these um, concepts, I could put a quick outline together, um, and then it, it would be really awesome if we could have maybe a, um, uh, just a separate call for the people who are really interested in helping write some of the content to uh, to get together, and we could kind of split up the work if that makes sense. So do we have a tentative list of tools that we want to cover? I would, I think we can get um, a long way of the way there by using sort of covering FIO and, and Sysbench potentially, um, unless anybody has sort of like an idea for a, another killer tool. But I think those two probably give us a lot of the things we're looking for day one. Cool. Um, so in that case, um, I don't know, Suku, if there's um, a specific person you think we could work with, um, and, and Nick, um, is, there, is there a particular time we, we could um, we could sit down and, and sort of uh, kick off after uh, I send out the outline. Sure. Yeah, I will. Uh, uh, I I uh, I thought I might. I vaguely remember asking you for your email to start a thread, but I don't think I actually started it. <laughs> ah, okay. Why don't I do that then? I'll I'll ping <laughs> I'll, I'll ping <laughs> you guys an email and um, and we'll start a thread. That makes sense. Thank and you. And then I'll much. add uh, the engineer that uh, ran the benchmarks for us. Fantastic. That would be brilliant. Okay. So that was the last thing on the agenda. Did anybody have any other um, items that they wanted to cover today?
So the, there was a third document that we discussed, uh, which uh, I'm trying to remember what it was. I think it was uh, how to run each system. Um, the use case examples that uh, that Luis was, was working on, right? Yeah, oh yes, that one, yeah, yeah. Um, so Luis wasn't on the call or wasn't able to join today, so, so I didn't put it on the agenda, but maybe we can discuss it next time. Sounds good, yeah. Because because ideally we want that template ready for KubeCon as well. Yeah. If at all possible. Anything else? Okay. In that case, I think we're done. That's four minutes to spare. Thanks for joining everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Alex. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Here. Bye. Bye.